When I was a schoolboy, I had, as indeed every boy in any school in Cardiff who was entering in those days, issued to me the Bible translated by King James or his panel in 1611. Now, when one opened the fly book and saw all that, one was therefore encouraged to believe that this was obviously a great man, James I. What was not my surprise to find in this book a quite different version of the view of that same man. Listen to this. At length, in March 1625, in the 59th year of his age, passed away a monarch who believed fully in what Alexander Pope so aptly calls the right divine of kings to govern wrong. Admired neither by English nor Irish, James may, from the standpoint of the letter, be justly described as the recreant son of a martyred queen. Remember that he came from Scotland, Stuart, and it was James the Sixth of Scotland who became James the First of England when the Tudor line, which seems to have had some curse upon it, we don't know, anyway, it petered out, didn't it? The Tudors, after all the damage they'd done before petering out, and then the Stuarts came in from Scotland. Anyway, admired neither by English nor Irish, James may have been described as the recreant son of a martyred queen, causing between four and five million statute acres of Irish land to be confiscated and allotted to Protestant aliens. And we're reaping the consequences, aren't we, of that unrest in the tissue of Irish society to this day. He also made many galling additions to the already drastic penal laws against the Catholic religion. But despite all, the Catholics, in here of course, refused to submit. Deprived of their chiefs and leaders, robbed of their churches and property, exhausted by famine and pestilence, they still did not count their country as hopelessly crushed, nor give up their cause as entirely lost. A little hope already glimmered on the horizon, and in their hearts they must have experienced real consolation in the thought that not all the cruel legislation of their enemies had effected their slightest diminution in the ardour of their loyalty to the faith and to the proscribed mass. Now what happened eventually, of course, was that James II came along and we know how that had an effect on Ireland, in fact not far from here. We know that the Battle of the Boy was the last time in human history, as far as I remember, where two crowned heads were actually fighting physically a battle against each other. Very interesting point in history, the Battle of Boyne, just down the road from where I live. And you know also that James II did actually pray in Christ Church in Dublin, and the tabernacle before which he praised, prayed is still there in the crypt, shown to all and sundry. So he had a faith. And the history of Europe could have gone a different way altogether at that time. Now, what am I saying? <clears throat> this book contains all that came from those unfortunately dashed hopes into the terrible period of penal laws that followed. Because eventually, and they were succeeding, they were trying by anemia <coughs> to wean the Catholics from their faith. Take away the bricks, take away the structure, then take away eventually even the priests. And actually that's how they got Wales, because it was through anemia. They did not eventually have access to priests. Therefore, bit by bit, the faith was completely lost in Wales, the old faith. In Ireland, it still hang on. But the tragedy is this, my friends, that very quickly, we have forgotten all that. Because it's not that long ago when we had a situation where people really had to struggle 
to get to Mars. Now, I want to mention one or two things in this context of this day between St. Patrick's Day and St. Joseph's Day. The first is this. Ireland was graced in a quite supernatural way from the moment of first evangelization under Patrick until this last period. I saw the difference even when I was in Ireland in the mid-80s before in Roscrae and how bit by bit from what it was massively still then to what it is now being chiseled away just by erosion from forces which are actually quite obviously satanic. And the way in which, e.g., recently we have seen, or I have not seen myself, I've heard from others, the way that, for instance, if one compared the coverage of the papal election or the rest of it <coughs> by RTE with other mainline channels, such as the Rai in Italy, the BBC itself, it was actually appalling, uh, from what I can make out, that there were long pauses in which the latest nonsense was being put by people who had the clue what they were talking about, filling the air with reminders of scandal and all the rest of it. It's actually showing how very, very, in even human terms, unprofessional RTE has got to be able to get to that level. But it also shows how hugely powerful Satan is trying to get at immortal souls through that to which they have access, the television. So just be careful, my friends, because I insist yet again, we do not have to watch RTE. If you are watching a screen, watch something which nourishes your soul. EWTN is a gift of providence for our time. It's quite different taking in RTE and EWTN. One is edifying your soul and giving you grace. The other is giving you yet more of the same thing which precisely Satan wants you to hear. And you listen to what people are repeating. They're repeating basically what RT is telling you to repeat. Very people think it out for themselves. Now, with regard to this, if St. Patrick is aware of what's going on right now in Ireland, I am quite sure that he is deeply, deeply upset by what is happening right now in one specific area as well. It's that of allowing eventually, and it's going to happen, you can see it down the line coming, they're going to get this sacrifice, sacrifice to Moloch, Irish babies offered on the altar of Satan. That's what Satan wants, and he's going to get it. We know perfectly well because he has access to people who are playing his game. And therefore, I suppose we can pray and so on, but I mean it's basically Satan having a field day, and no one really is doing much about it in high positions. Now, the point is this, for him to get that far, it means that he's completely got into the mindset of all those concerned, even people who perhaps might still be going to church themselves, are not anymore able to do anything about them because of the whole system in which they're involved. Now, what I'm getting at is this, all this presumes one thing, that the story stops in this life, but it doesn't. Listen to this. <coughs> I've mentioned this person to you before, but it's worth mentioning it again because of what he saw when he died. It's this priest, an Indian, who gave his testimony some years ago. He was caught up in a fatal road accident not long after his ordination. He was a good man, and obviously in a state of grace and fidelity. This gentleman, on Sunday, the 14th of April, 1975, which was actually a piece of divine mercy, was going to celebrate Mass at a mission church in northern Kerala and he had this fatal accident. So I just quote what he says. I was riding a motorcycle when I was hit on, that is head on, by a jeep driven by a man who was intoxicated after a Hindu festival. I was rushed to a hospital about 35 miles away. Now, then it starts. On the way, my soul came out from my body, and I experienced death. 
immediately I met my guardian angel. That's interesting that at that point we meet our guardian angel for the first time and see him and recognize him. I saw my body, well that's classic isn't it, in these experiences when I'm looking down, and the people who were carrying me to, to the hospital. I heard them crying and praying for me. At this time my angel told me, I am going to take you to heaven. The Lord wants to meet you and talk with you. He also said that on the way he wanted to show me hell and purgatory. Now you'll see why I'm coming into this now. First, <coughs> the angel escorted me to hell. It was an awful sight. I saw Satan and the devils and an unquenchable fire and dreadful heat. Worms crawling, people screaming and fighting, others being tortured by demons. The angel told me that all these sufferings were due to unrepented mortal sin. And you last hear that in the pulpit. Unrepented mortal sin. Then I understood that there are seven degrees of suffering, or levels, according to the number and kinds of mortal sins committed during their earthly lives. The souls looked ugly, cruel and horrific. It was a fearful experience. And I heard that, but the same thing was shown to the children adolescents of Medjugorje way back, that they were given this kind of tour as well. And apparently they saw that souls who were leaving the body and not making it to heaven but going down were actually changing form. They were becoming demonic in form. That is, from being beautiful souls, they became similar to the ones that they had been serving. And their souls then became like demons. So how horror that must be to see oneself becoming demonic in form. Just think the shock that the soul must have. I saw people whom I knew, but I am not allowed to reveal their identities. Now listen to this bit. The sins that convicted them were mainly, now politicians take note, but it doesn't finish therefore when you vote for something in Parliament, were mainly abortion, homosexuality, that sound familiar? Euthanasia. Interesting one coming here. Hatefulness. People who die in unforgiveness, bitterness, hatred, family issues. That's very Irish, isn't it? Unforgiveness. So this, they put two here. Hate, hatefulness and then unforgiveness separately. And this one. Sacrilege. Sacrilege. Now look at Ireland right now. How much sacrilege is going on on a Sunday? People don't even think about going to confession. And they're all traipsing up to Holy Communion. And they're behaving in a way which shows that they're not handling the Lord well, even physically. They're talking to each other very quickly and so on. In other words, sacrilege is everywhere, big time. It has its consequences. The angel told me that if they had repented, in other words, God is mercy still, obviously, it's not God's fault, they would have avoided hell and gone instead to purgatory. It's the last hope of salvation, purgatory. I also understood that some people who repent from their sins might be purified on earth. Therefore, people who suffer a lot, they can be doing it here on earth through their sufferings. This way, they can avoid purgatory and go even straight to heaven. Now listen, I was surprised when I saw in hell even priests and bishops, some of whom I never expected to see. And by the way, that came through in Carabandal, which is it's a whole circuit of things which has been re-examined again recently, Carabandal. It was quashed for a while, but it has been the, the present bishop and the previous one were uh, are far more open to it. But they seemed that Carabandal were given this message too, the number of bishops and people actually going down and leading their flock with them. So that's frightening stuff. Anyway, many of them 
were there because they had misled the people precisely. The onus and responsibility on people in authority is huge, whether in politics or in the church. If we're leading others, we have a huge responsibility before, before God because all power is from God and we're wielding it in his name, for better or for worse. With false teaching and bad example, and apparently one of the things that leads priests into a messy beyond is the way they handle the Blessed Sacrament. That's a constant, and all these souls have been in the of meeting what's going on in the beyond. There's direct relation between a priest's future and the way he behaves at the altar, because he's handling God directly there. After the visit to hell, my guardian angel escorted me to purgatory. Here too, there are seven degrees of suffering and unquenchable fire. And some theologians say, by the way, that uh, at least in the lowest levels of purgatory, that, that the fire is of the same nature as in hell, but it does not last forever kind of thing, but there's something similar apparently. Here too, there are seven degrees of suffering, but it is far less intense than hell, and there was neither quarrelling nor fighting, because there's hope, hope, the bottom line is we're getting out of here. The main suffering of these souls is their separation from God, and that's correct. Uh, theology. There are two things, by the way, in purgatory. In theology, they call it la peine, we have it in French, la peine du don, le, le, the, the pain of loss, <coughs> the fundamental absence of beatific vision for which the soul is made, that is then till the last moment of purgatory. But the other, la peine des sens, the, the, pain, the pain of senses, corresponds to each sense of use. Because what's happening is this. In this life, we take from the order of creation, from God, pleasure. We filch pleasure illicitly by the abuse of a certain sense in sin. What happens? There is a perfect restitution of order. In the beyond, it all has to be rebalanced. Therefore, as in the case of great saints who have sacrificed with the senses, they are recompensed accidentally on those senses which have been sacrificed. So, in purgatory, there is this accidental extra pain making up in the beyond for the filching of that illicit pleasure. Now, in hell, it's total. Therefore, hell is not equal. It is the fundamental loss of glory and contact with the Creator, the same as all, but then you've got also all the uneven and all possible degrees in between of evil done and so on. So therefore it's all the possibilities possible, and by the way, you know that if, for instance, a person dies and has had all kinds of wonderful things in this world, it's not necessarily a good sign. That which I translated from the French years ago, the hell uh, letter there, the one that came from back from hell, that talks about this quite explicitly. That if God foresees that a soul is not going to make it, despite all his generosity in that soul's favour, what happens? God, because there's in some soul an element of, in inverted commas, goodness, somehow, he recompenses that in this world. So what one sees is this. People apparently have got it all going for them, but it doesn't mean that they've got it all going for them at all. It's actually quite the reverse. It's, they're getting it all here, but in the beyond, there's nothing at all. That can be actually the, the tragic case of a person who, in this world, is succeeding brilliantly. So don't judge people by this apparent success in this world. In the beyond, it might be quite the reverse. Now, <coughs> Some of those who are in purgatory committed numerous mortal sins, but they were reconciled with God before their deaths. Even though these souls are suffering, they enjoy peace and the knowledge that one day they will see God face to face. So the fundamental issue is that we will get there. Therefore, the whole hope there is fundamentally different with regard to some people, apparently, really ought to have been lost. But God, at the last moment, somehow managed to give one last big grace, just enough for them to say some kind of say yes on that minimal light which they could see while they were dying. And it was enough 
for them just to make it, but maybe to the lowest level of purgatory for a long, 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 long time, but they're so glad to be there, even though it's awful. So the lowest level of purgatory is very close to hell, because you know there is a certain element of actually going in directions when one dies. The soul does leave the body and starts to move. And going down means actually just that. And this question, it's not just medieval mythology, but there is actually a going down. And they're going to a terrible heat. They're going actually in towards the center of the earth. And that's where, of course, you've got all this satanic warfare going on. And we know, even from modern science, that when they dig into the crust of the earth in the oceans, things start to happen. Strange <coughs> things come out. There's a huge heat out there, and also these strange creatures start to emerge. When they actually pierce at the lowest level of the ocean, things happen there, which indicate that even science is puzzled when it comes to fighting into that last level of nature which we can meet on this earth. When it's only about one mile between the lowest part of certain parts of the ocean and further into where things start to change. Because after one goes boring even further, the nature of the earth changes. It's quite different down there afterwards. It's not just land as we know it. There's a huge amount of heat down there, and things, as I say, come out of it. It's, it's a strange business. But it's on YouTube, all this. It can be just examined like any scientific study. Therefore, all this business of where souls go, they do actually move. So if they're going to that horrible place, with that horrible company, it's not the best way to spend eternity. And of course, they realize it. There's no coming back. They can't do anything about this movement. They follow the way in which they're gravitated. A soul weighed against God is that way fixed. And down and away it goes. It can't face God. Now, do you see how serious this is? That soul then, for the first time, is encountering itself and time. It's not spent time in the one thing that mattered, and it's too late when it gets to that point. And that's the great game the devil is playing right now. Comparing Ireland now with only 40 years ago when still people were thinking about the beyond. The goggle box is the great means of getting people away from thought. Get them into the immediate of pleasure. Anything but face thought. Face life. Just get them on the superficial of things. It's a huge ploy. And all of Western society is that way way, the immediate. Don't think, and if you do think about God, do it in such a way that it ridiculizes it. It's all a huge ploy. And now if you can get all the politicians and great men of the television, actually every time the church or God comes into it, just having a bash, it shows how powerful Satan is, giving that norm in the air. So be careful. Every time you tune into that, you're actually playing the devil's game. You're giving him a stage. You're giving him a vocal cord again. You don't have to. You don't need to. I say, watch something which feeds your soul. It makes you think precisely about <coughs> where you're going. It's time better used. Now, they asked me to pray for them, these souls in purgatory, and to tell the people to pray for them as well, so they can go to heaven quickly. When we pray for these souls, we will receive their gratitude through their prayers, and we know that those who have a great devotion to the holy souls have all kinds of things happening to them. They're always grateful. And once they enter heaven, their prayers become even more meritorious, obviously. It is difficult for me to describe how beautiful my guardian angel is. He is radiant and bright. He is my constant companion and helps me in all my ministries, especially my healing ministry. I experience his presence everywhere I go, and I am grateful for his protection in my daily life. You know, St. Francois de Sales used to pray, before he was about to preach, he would, first of all, invoke invoke all the guardian angels present before him, because every person has a guardian angel, therefore you multiply the number of people present, and you've got, therefore, straight away the number of guardian angels as well in church. So you would zoom into all these guardian angels and get them to pray with his own and with himself, open each soul in your care here to this word, so that right now when he was preaching, he was also getting all this angelic intervention, open them to the power of the word, because the word has power over souls and over time. 
And you know that the devil has actually said this at one time in a recent exorcism. When the devil wants to damn a person, he gets them to not hear sermons. Because that way he gets them precisely not to think. And that's actually what's going on. If you look at what's going on now and now, you've got not only that voice of Satan coming from all these means of communication, but also the absence of other counterbalancing effect. How many people actually hear sermons now in church? It's rather sad, but they're getting a few thoughts. So it's not enough to counterbalance all this trash coming out all the time in the media. We need powerful sermons, able precisely to give them people the means they have a need of to get out of this other stuff in the air. And if there's all this downplaying of the importance of preaching, it's again a huge victory for the enemy of the soul. So just observe, watch what's going on and why. Things don't just happen like that. There are profound, unfortunately, supernatural, big natural reasons for things going wrong. <coughs> Lastly, heaven. Next, my angels escorted me to heaven, passing through a big, dazzlingly white tunnel. I never experienced this much peace and joy in my life. Then immediately heaven opened up, and I heard the most delightful music. Now, music is the language of beauty. It actually means the art of the muses, musique techne. And look at what is around a so-called music nowadays. People don't know what beauty is. If they did, they would not be plugged into thumping noises. They would want something a bit more elevating. Again, a victory, because we need something which touches and heals the soul. And the same in church. How much beauty do we actually hear in church now? It's often pretty shoddy or nothing at all. Because when we're celebrating properly, we're actually reproducing on earth something of the angelic praise of heaven. Then the angels were singing and praising God. I saw all the saints, especially the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, and many dedicated holy bishops and priests who were shining like stars. Now himself. When I appeared before the Lord Jesus, he told me, I want you to go back to the world. In your second life, you will be an instrument of great peace and healing to my people. You will walk in a foreign land, and you will speak in a foreign tongue. Everything is possible for you with my grace. After these words, the Blessed Mother told me, Do whatever he tells you. I will help you in your ministries. Words cannot express the beauty of heaven. There we find so much peace and happiness which exceed a, billion, a million times our imagination. Our Lord is far more beautiful than any image can convey. His face is radiant and luminous and more beautiful than a thousand rising suns. The pictures we see in this world are only a shadow of his magnificence. The Blessed Maja was, was next to Jesus. She was so beautiful and radiant None of the images we can see in this world can compare with her real beauty. Heaven is our real home. We are all created to reach heaven and enjoy God forever. The devil knows it, so what does he do? He puts before us things which attract our sensuality, pornography and all the rest of it. How many people right now are glued into pornographic sites? Men, respectable people, they turn on and they just gravitate towards the latest <coughs> porno. It's awful, and that's filling their mind, because it, it works on such a way that it actually draws all the energy of the soul in that filthy direction. Is that the way to die? So that's what we're up against, my friends. The devil is getting even the young people. Even children very quickly learn how to navigate into pornographic sites. A huge victory for the evil one. So I just finished, my friends. This is what we're up against on this feast of St. Joseph, who is the guardian of virgins. We need to pray especially for purity for ourselves, for the young people, and also for the Church of God, of which he is the universal protector. We need to ask St. Joseph to rebuild the church using precisely the great gift that the Lord has given us in this new Holy Father, who's taken the name of Francis, who, remember, was told, rebuild my church. Precisely through a return to the Gospel, the essence, authenticity. And by the way, have you noticed, this Pope preaches from the heart. 
like St. Francis, without notes. Everywhere he goes, he's going to get people there where they will listen. People will watch somebody who's actually preaching at them, to them, and to their hearts. It's a great gift we have. Let's enter into mode. And remember, we need the word. For the word heals, challenges, and orientates man for all eternity.